me here. Let me go ahead and start recording. Y'all, what I did was I went to my open math and I just printed out the entire review. Okay. So I got all 40 questions here. And then really, again, the objective today, y'all, is, again, I'm hoping that you guys have gone over these questions already. And the objective is, <clears throat> what questions do you need help with? Which ones are you uncertain about uh, that you want me to go over? Because that's what, what it is we're doing. Okay, I'm answering any questions you guys might have out of the review. So again, you know, the review was open for a while. I was hoping that you guys had an opportunity to go through some of the problems and say, oh, you know what, I didn't know how to do this one, or I didn't know how to do that one, or can we go over number 17, or whatever it happens to be. So, I'm all ears, guys. You guys tell me which ones, which ones you all want. Anything, 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 anything? Okay, so we're good. We're good with one and two. Okay. Anybody need anything from number three? How do we find the rate of change from x equals one to x equals five? So what would you do here? What would be your what would be your your game plan, you guys? If you're doing number three, what would you do? Yeah, you say, look, what are the coordinates at that point right there? Anybody know? One five, okay. What are the coordinates roughly from this point here? I'll give you a hint. Five and 1.5. And then wouldn't you just use the slope formula? And question, let me ask you a question, guys. Wouldn't I do the same thing for problems one and two? Because what is that? What is it asking me to find? It's asking me to find the what? The average rate of change, right? So aren't I really finding the slope for number one and number two? And a number one, I'm gonna the two numbers I'm gonna plug in are what zero and the other number would be two. So we're gonna figure out what f of zero is. We're gonna find out what f of two is. Whatever values we get, I'm gonna call this y one. I'm gonna call this y two. And then again, we'll use our slope formula, right? Y2 minus Y1 over, I'll give you a hint, two minus two. Okay, let me ask you a question. Okay, but hold on. Look at question number three. We didn't do any derivatives on number three, did we? Same thing, right? It's the same thing because it's asking me for the average rate of change, right? When you're doing derivative sums, you're finding the instantaneous rate of change. Okay. Same thing here with number two, y'all. Wouldn't, wouldn't we do the same thing? We're looking for what? What's the key word here that tells me I'm going to do some tracking and dividing? Average. Right. Average rate of change tells me I'm doing slope. Okay. And I'm doing like the slope formula. I'm finding two points. And I'm finding the slope of the line, right? Between those two points. When it says find the instantaneous rate of change, then we're doing derivative, right? Good question. Good question. Look, y'all. Look at this. Is I don't know why they, they put them. Why I printed out with such a gap between here and here. But look at question number four. For the function shown below, draw the secant line. Isn't that what we did in number three? Weren't we really finding the slope of the secant line in number three? So when I look at number four, we're doing exactly the same thing, right? I'm going to from x equals one to x equals four. So this point here and that point there. I'm going to ask you a question. Would the rate of change in this one be positive or negative? Positive, because so the line's going up, right? And in looking at question number three, was the average rate of change here would have been positive or negative? Because the line was going down, right? Good, y'all. Y'all, one thing I really want to emphasize, and I know that's kind of a, a very fundamental topic or a fundamental idea, but it's great if you guys understand that because I think that's like I'm gonna I'm just gonna say this from the perspective of somebody who teaches math, it's so important to at least have that understanding of hey, should my rate of change be positive or should my rate of change be negative, right? 
and like I said, I think it's just it it's almost like the best analogy I can use it to is do you understand like you know your bearings. You know which way is north or south or east or west. You, if you understand that, then you can kind of get to places, right? So if we were right here, we're here we are at SPC and we wanted to head to Brownsville, would we head north, south, east or west? We'd head east, right? Because Brownsville or the beach is east of us, right? If we were gonna go to say Rio Grande City, oh we're gonna go west, right? If we're gonna go to Mexico, we're gonna go south, right? If we're gonna go to Oklahoma, we're going to go north, right? So just having that general understanding, I think, is really, really important. You know, like I said, I, you know, for somebody who teaches now, the fact that you guys know that, I get a real nice, warm feeling right here in my panza, not because I had papas a la mexicana this morning. You know what I mean? Because that's, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good, that's a good thing to have. Okay, so take a look at the next one. This is number question number five. Uh, so let me see. I'm just taking a look here. We're looking for limits. So what do y'all think? Y'all are y'all good with this problem? You want me to go over it? It's up to you guys. What what does that mean? Are we gonna go over it or are we good? We're gonna go over it. Okay. So let's take a look at the first part. Uh we're finding the limit as x approaches. What does this mean, y'all? What does that tell me? Negative one from the left. Excellent, good. Okay, so look, here's negative one. We're coming in from the left. As we're coming in from the left, right before we hit negative one. What value would we getting would be we be getting close to? Negative what? Negative two, right? Okay. Good. Now look at the next one. We're approaching negative one, but from what direction? From the positive side, from the right, right? So we're coming over here to negative one, and right before we hit negative one, if we go up, what value are we getting close to? Three. Okay. Now the third part of the question says, what's the limit as x approaches negative 1? What would we say here? But the limit, we're looking for the limit. Remember what the limit means, though? The limit says, what's the limit from the left and what's the limit from the right? And as long as those two limits are the same, then that's what the limit is. And this one, we would say, does not exist, right? And why doesn't it exist? I agree, but why not? Because they're not approaching the same value, right? Those two those two limits y'all happen to be different, right? So again, remember, in order for the limit to exist, I'm really glad that you, you asked us to go over this question because I think it is important. And again, I think we understand it, but we maybe just forgot a couple of things. But yeah, in order for the limit to exist, y'all, the limit from the left and the limit from the right have to be the same value, okay? And then finally, there is a there's a fourth part to it, and it says, what is f of negative 1? So remember what that means. f of negative 1 means I'm going to come right here to negative 1, and I'm either going to have to go up to hit my graph, or I'm going to have to go down. Which way would I have to go? Down. And when we hit down, what value do we get? Negative. Negative. I'm sorry, say that again? F of 1, what number would we have hit? About 1 and a half? Does that make sense? Right. So again, let me ask you a question, y'all. I know this is not the question, but would we say is F continuous at x equals negative one, what would you say? Yeah, right. yeah. It's not continuous. In order for it to be continuous, though, the limit has to exist, the function evaluated at that point has to exist, and number two, they have to be the same value. So the limit and the function evaluated at that value would have to be the same, right? Yeah. Well, you couldn't fill this in here and fill this in here, right? We couldn't, we couldn't do that. But let me ask you a question. Could we do this? Suppose instead of negative one, we change all of these to positive one. And then we were to say, does the limit, is F continuous at one? So we would say, look, as I'm coming in from one to the left, I'm getting close to about one and a half. 
and I'm coming in from the right, I'm still getting close to about one and a half. So the limit is, as x approaches one, would be one and a half. And then evaluated at one would still be one and a half. So it would be continuous at one, it's just not continuous at negative. Right? Does that make more sense? Good, good. All right. Excellent. Yeah, it's recording. Let me double check what it should be. Come back over here. Yeah, we're we'll good. That happened to me last Thursday in my night class. We did a review, and I forgot to hit the forward. So that was a bummer. Okay, let's take a look. Same thing going on here. Do you guys need help with this one, or are we okay? We're good? Okay. So let's keep scrolling. Let's go to number seven. What do you think? We're still good? Okay. Awesome, awesome. All right. Take a look at number eight. Let's take a look at number eight first, and then we'll look at nine. But let me ask you one thing. Does anybody need help with eight? Do you know how to find, okay, how do, how do we find the limit? Question, how do you do it? What would you do? Anybody know? How do we find the limit as x approaches four? Uh, can we? Okay, so sometimes we can't. So should we, should the, should the plan be, should we try? Yeah, right. If sometimes we can't, then we should try though, right? So what are we going to do? Everywhere we have an X, we're going to plug in a Okay, so 4 times 4 squared is 64 plus 8. Uh, 3 times 4 is 12 minus 7 is 5. Uh, 64 plus 8 should be 72. Anybody know what 72 times 5 is? So what do we do? Plug in x equals 4, right? Okay. Okay. So look, take a look, y'all. Let's do the same thing here. Let's try plugging 0 in. Sine of 7 times 0 over sine of 4 times 0. So sine of 7 times 0 is still the sine of 0. Uh, 4 times 0 is still 0. Anybody know what the sine of 0 is? Guess again. Guess again. You need your calculator if you need to, guys. Huh? 0. Can we divide by 0? No. Okay. But but let me ask you a question. Hold on. We're not we're not quite done yet. But let me ask you a question. Do we not still use the same approach on number nine as we did on number eight? Yes. That should always be my approach, y'all. When I'm finding the limit of a of a function, my first approach would be plug the number in, see if it works. Okay. If it doesn't, then we got to do something different. Okay. So we're going to do something different. First thing we're going to do here, y'all. I'm going to look at this as the sine of 7 theta. I'm going to put a 7 theta on the bottom and a 7 theta on the top. Okay? Because if I divide and multiply by the same factor, I haven't really changed it a whole lot, right? I'm going to do the same thing here. The sine of 4 theta over 4 theta, and I'm going to multiply by a 4 theta over here. Okay, but hold on. We're gonna get we're gonna get there in a minute. Next question. Since we're taking the limit as theta approaches zero, so y'all, when we did the limit, and I'm gonna kind of do this over here on the side. When we found the limit as say x approached zero of the sine of x over x, this I believe was equal to. Oh my God, I can't believe I'm forgetting it right now. You know what? I'm going to have it in my formula sheet. I'm going to scroll back to my formula sheet, y'all, because off the top of my head, I just don't remember. Oh, excuse me. I have it in my formula sheet somewhere. I don't want to get rid of that far. Let me come back over here. Let me get my 
Let me see. Where is that? Here we go. One. Okay, here, where's formula sheet? Formula sheet right here. Formula sheet test one. So it's going to be in here somewhere. I know I wrote it. I just can't remember off the top of my head. So I'll get, 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 get rid of that. It's in my chapter two notes, I know that. Let so me scroll back to my chapter two notes and see what I can I don't remember off the top of my head, y'all. I don't remember if it's zero or if it's one, but I'm pretty sure it's one. But I just don't remember off the top of my head. So I'm going to scroll and see if I can Down. I'm pretty sure it's equal to one. I just don't know that's the top of There we go. There's the problem. Anyway, if we get it somehow. Pretty confident it's equal to one. Let's see that. We'll get it somewhere. It has to be in 2.2 now. <laughs> yeah, I know. What did you forget? Uh, here we go. You can get it. I'm gonna... there, it is. here we go. Boom. There we go. Okay. So we did this, but if you look here, y'all, this is the graph of, let me zoom in just a little bit so we can see it a little bit better. This is the limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x. So I want you to notice something here. As x was getting smaller and smaller and smaller, what was the limit approaching? As we're coming from 0, either from the left or the right, what value were we getting close to? Getting close to 1, right? Okay, so there we go. We're approaching 1, right? So the limit as x approaches 0, sine of x over x is equal to 1, right? Now, remember what limit we're taking here. We're taking the limit as theta approaches 0. The only difference, y'all, between the limit as theta approaches 0, sine of 7 theta over theta, and sine of 4 theta over theta, is that now my x, instead of me using x, we're using what? 7 theta, and we're using 4 theta, right? So wouldn't each of these limits here approach the value of 1, okay, next thing I'm going to do, I can get rid of my thetas, so now I have 1 over 1 times 7 over 4, which is just 7 fourths, and again, if I'm taking the limit as theta approaches 0, the only thing we're left with is 7 over 4. So there we go. Okay. So here we go, yeah. The limit as x approaches 0 of sine of x over x is equal to 1. Okay. But again, I want you to notice something. The approach on number 9, we did the same approach as we did on number 8. The first thing we said is, can you plug the value in? And if we're okay, then hey, wait, we got it done. If not, then we have to do a little bit of manipulation. Okay. All right. Anybody need me to go through number 10? Yeah, it doesn't work that way, right? We're in big school now, guys. We're in big school now. I'm happy to do any one you want me to do. Just tell me which one you want me to do. I'm sorry? Anybody want number 10? You want number 10? Okay, let's do number 10. So look what it says. 
Suppose the function h satisfies that h of x is between these two functions, right? That's what that, that's what that inequality means. It's between those two, right? We want to use the squeeze theorem to evaluate the limit as x approaches negative one of h of x. So first, look what it says. First, evaluate the limit as x approaches negative one of this function right here. What would we do? Plug it in. So negative four times negative one minus two times negative one squared minus five. So that's going to give me a positive four. Uh, negative one squared is positive one, so that's still a minus two and a minus five. So four minus two is negative two. Uh, I'm sorry, four minus two is two minus five, negative three. So negative three for that. Okay. What would I do for the second one? Plug it in, just like we did before. So negative one squared plus two times negative one minus two. So negative one squared is one. That becomes a minus two minus two. So one minus two is negative one minus two is also negative three. So look what it's saying, guys. H of X is between these two functions, right? And if we take the limit as X approaches negative one of the first one, we came up with negative three. And as we took the limit as X, X I'm sorry, X approaches negative one of the second one, we came up with negative three. And if H of X is gonna be between those two values, for the limit have to be equal to negative three, right? So they call it the squeeze term, y'all. When, uh, when I took the calculus class, like back in, I don't know, early 90s, they called it the sandwich theorem. But it's the same sort of idea. This function is being squeezed between those two, or it's being sandwiched in between those two. So as we take the limit, what, uh, as in this case, is that supposed to be negative one? If we got negative three, and this one was negative three, since that function is in the middle, it's also going to have to be negative three. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Because you got to put it in for yeah. Yeah. So when you do this, what that's telling you is square the number one and then attach a negative sign at the end of it. Yeah. So you got to do your parentheses, right? So notice how I did mine here. Parentheses, right? Notice how I did it here. Parentheses, right? So you got to you got to make sure you're doing the same thing. That's the idea. Y'all, question. What do you think we should do here? What would be the first approach? Plug it in. Good. Thank you, Steve. Sine of 14 times 0 over 0. So this is a sine of 0. I'm not to say that anymore, but a 0. Sine of 0 over 0. So what should we say? Okay, well, we know we can't do that. Okay. So, all right. We're going to try second approach. Second approach would be, look, just like we did earlier, y'all, on this one up here, see how we introduced a seventh eight on the bottom and a seventh eight on the top, and we introduced a fourth eight on the bottom and a fourth eight on the top? We're going to come back. We're going to use that same approach here. So look, we have the sine of 14x, right? Now, what do we already have on the bottom? The part that I'm missing is the, so if I put the 14 on the bottom, I got to put 14 on the top, don't I? Now, wouldn't you agree with me that the limit as x approaches zero of sine of 14x over x would be equal to what value? Would be equal to one, and one times 14 is still? There you go. Does that make sense? Yeah. I'm sorry? Okay, but hold on. Before we go to the next one, are we good on 11, y'all? Yes. So remember how we did, remember when we came back earlier and we did this problem, and we had to introduce that factor of 7 theta, both upstairs and upstairs, so that this part here would be equal to 1, right? And the same thing here, 
Linda said that that part there would be equal to one. So when I'm looking at this problem here, we're saying, look, we already have, we want, we want the angle here to be the same thing as I have here. And I'm like, oh, well, look, I already have the X, so I, all I need really is the 14. Because now this piece down here and this piece right here are exactly the same. So now, as we take the limit as x approaches 0, this value is going to be equal to 1, and I have 1 times 14, which is just 14. Is that better? Good, good. So right here, we're just going to put a 14. Excellent. Good question. All righty. Anybody need help with number 12? Are we good? You're going to do it? Y'all tell me, y'all. Can you just plug it in? What value are you plugging in? Okay, are we going to get a, are we going to get a zero on the bottom? Okay. What should we do? Factor it, right? Isn't this one of those easy dudes to cover girl factor in comments? Because the number there is the one. I'm looking for two numbers that multiply to a 48, but add up to a 14, 6 and 8. Can't we get rid of the x plus 6s? So now we're left with an x plus 8. And if we take the limit as x approaches negative 6, wouldn't we be equal to 2? And all we have to do is some easy breezy cover go faster. You know? All right. Anybody want me to go to 13? Are we good? What do you think? Literally giving you the balance. What are you going to do? Plug and sub, right? All right. Let's see. So let's take a look. This is number 14. The graph below is the function f of x. Okay. Determine which one of the rules for continuity is first violated at f of a equals negative 1. Okay. So let's see. Uh, the rules of continuity, y'all, let me see. I want to say that we have that in my formula sheet. Let me go back to my formula sheet over here. I want to say there's some rules on continuity, so I'm going to scroll down until I find it. Here we go. So look right here, y'all. A function f is continuous at a point A if and only if the following three conditions are satisfied. Okay, so look, it says f of a is defined. Okay, let me ask the question. Is f of negative 1 defined? So at negative 1, would we have, could we go either up or down and hit our graph? Yes. yes. And we would hit what value? 2. So it's defined, we're okay there. We're, we're not, we haven't violated that rule. Okay. Let's come back to my formula sheet. Does the limit exist? So let's come back over here. Does the limit exist, y'all? What do you think? Does the limit here exist at x at a equals negative 1? What's the limit as x approaches negative 1 of f of x? And very good. Limit, Linda says it does not exist, right? Because, why doesn't it exist? I agree with you, but why not? They're not the same, right? The limit from the left is not the same as the limit from the right, right? Therefore, it doesn't exist. So this is the one that we that we first violated. Does that make sense? And again, all I'm doing, y'all, I'm just using my rule for continuity. Okay. Same type of question. 
Now look at this direction here. It says the graph below is a function of f of x. Select all statements that you agree with. Uh, so let's see. Okay, is f of 2 defined? Boom. Does the limit as x approaches 2 exist? Does it exist? What would you say? Remember, what does it mean for the limit to exist, y'all? It means that the limit from which side? The limit from the left, the limit from the right, happen to be the same value. Coming from the left. As x is approaches 2 from the left, what value are we hitting for our f or our y value? 1. What about when we come in from the right? What are we hitting? Okay. Do it exist? Okay, right? And we said it's equal to what value again? Okay. Now, second question. Does the limit here equal that value there? No. So I'm not going to check that box. I'm checking the box that the boxes that we what agree with, right? Okay, so the limit f of 2 was defined. The limit existed. Okay, is the function continuous at 2 or is it not continuous at 2? Not continuous at 2. That's the other one I'm going to check. That's right, there's no gap, right? And in order for it to be continuous, this value here, y'all, had to have been over there, right? Yeah, the easiest way to think about it, y'all, in, in like very basic terms, can you draw the graph without having to take the pencil off the paper? And in this case, we couldn't, right? We'd have to take our pencil off to skip over that point, and we'd have to plot it down, down over there at negative 4. Okay, so use the definition of continuity to determine whether f of x is continuous at a. So in this case, we're looking at f of x equals 2x plus 5 at a equals 1. Okay. What do you think? Would it be continuous? What do you think? Okay, let me ask you a question. What would, what would the graph of this thing here look like? It'd be a straight line, okay? Wouldn't a straight line be continuous? Yeah. Right? So we would say continuous, right? Because, let me see. I'm, I, I can't click on this here, but I can go to, yeah, let me see. Question 16. This is good over here. Let me get to it. There we go. Let me do it. Let me do it from here. Let me see if I need to go back and do something. Um, let me try this. Let's see our home. Uh, oh, that's the quiz. So I'm going to do the quiz. Come back over here. Okay, let's do this. Let's review. Let's go. And let me try this. Open the new tab. Let me go to questions. We're looking at which one, number 16? Okay. So same time problem. So look, if I click on this, it'll tell me continuous because f of a is equal to the limit as x approaches a, right? So then that we say that in order for it to be continuous, the limit has to exist. The function evaluated at that value has to exist, and they got to be the same, right? <coughs> okay. Now, let's take a look at this one here f of x equals x squared minus 2, or x squared minus 4 over x minus 2 uh, at a equals 3. Okay, so first thing, if we wanted to know if it was continuous at 3, if we wanted to find the limit at 3, I'm going to come back to the same problem that I got right here, the same question. If we wanted to find the limit as x approached 3, what would be our approach? What would we do? Plug it in, right? Okay, question. What's 3 squared? 9 minus 4. What's 3 minus 2? 1, right? So 9 minus 4 is 5. 5 over 1 is 5. That's how we found the limit, right? Wouldn't we also have to find f of 3? But let me ask you a question. 
the way we found the limit, didn't we find the limit by basically plugging in F of three? And when we plugged in, and didn't we get five? So would we say it's continuous or not? Yeah, it would be continuous, right? So look, I'd come back over here. Let me click on this thing right here. Let me open this up a little bit better. So we'd say it's continuous because f of a equals the limit as x approaches a, right? Okay. Now we have a part C. We want to know is f of x continuous? Okay. If we were to find f of 5, right? If we were to find f of 5, we would end up with a 10 over what? Over 0, which is undefined, right? Okay, so I'm, I would say, number one, it's not continuous, right? So that's not what I wanted to do. Come back over here. It's discontinuous because why? The, the limit doesn't exist. That could be one reason. Uh, we could also say f of 5 doesn't exist, right? You, could, you know what I'm saying? There's, 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 the function doesn't exist at that particular value, right? But the limit doesn't exist either, okay? The limit doesn't exist either, okay? All right. Let me come back here. Okay. What do you think? Are you good? Are you not good? Which uh, one of the following rules for continuity is evaluated, uh, violated at x equals 2? Number one, does the limit exist? The limit does exist. Okay, is f of a defined? No. It's not defined, right? Like when we go to x equals 2 and you go up or down, you don't hit the graph, right? At 2, we're not going to hit the graph because they got a hole there. You see what I mean? So we had a, if we had something like this, oh, we'd say, okay, f of 2 is defined, right? But we don't have that. Because when we come back over here and we go along that line, we can see that we go right through the graph. Right? Good, good, good. Okay. So look, y'all, that, that, I'm still looking through my questions, but I want you to notice something here. All these problems, are all these, like, have I done a derivative yet? These are all limit and continuity type problems, right? Because the test is over chapters two and three, so you got... You know, roughly, hopefully half and half, right? Okay. Well, I'm hoping I picked half from chapter two and half from chapter three, but at least I can tell from the review that that's how I set it up, right? But again, but think about it this way, John. Hold on, let's just relax, right? Didn't I pick every question from the review? Okay. Dude, I, I cannot, I cannot, I cannot hand it to you any more than that. You understand my point? I can't hand it to you any more than that, right? Hopefully, half well, the review is half and half, right? Yeah. Well, you know, it is what it is, right? But also, again, I, I gave, you know, this is pretty much a handoff, right? I, you know what I mean? Right. Well, we, it could be like that too, right? But I doubt that that's what I did. Right. All right. What do you think? Are you all good with this one too? Right. I'm guessing at this point, the answer should be yes. Okay, now take a look at the next one here. It says, suppose f of x is a continuous function over the interval uh, from five to nine with f of five being equal to negative three and f of nine being equal to three. Determine which choice uh, best describes the following uh, statement. f of x is supposed to be equal to zero. I don't know if I didn't come out. f of x is equal to zero from some x in the interval from five to nine is this always false always true sometimes true and sometimes false okay so let's think about this for a minute y'all look what it's telling me here it's telling me that we have some function right and it's defined or it's continuous i'm sorry over the intervals when it's from x to five to nine right so look what we know at f of five the value is what negative one negative two negative three so this here is going to be a point right there. And f of 9 was equal to what value? 1, 2, and 3. Okay. And we said the function is continuous. Remember what that means. It's continuous over this interval. So doesn't that mean that my graph would, would do, it's, got a, it's, it's going to connect those two points. 
whether it's connected with a straight line, whether it's connected with some sort of curve, it's connected, okay? In order for it to be connected, would f of x equal zero always be false, always be true, or sometimes? What do you think? Look at my picture. Yeah. It's always going to be true, right? Because in order for me to connect this value down here, which is negative, and this value up here, which is positive, in order for me to connect those two points, i got to pass through the x-axis, don't I? And passing through the x-axis means f of x equals zero. Does that make sense? And, and the reason why we can do that, y'all, is because it says it's what? Continuous. continuous, right? So if it would not have said continuous, if it would not have mentioned continuous, then maybe we wouldn't have. You, know, you understand my point? Like, I'm going to make this. If, if it was not continuous, my graph could have done something like this and something like that with an open circle here and then the other point being down there, right? And it never actually crossed the x-axis, right? Because it was never actually equal to zero. Like the limit was going to zero at whatever this value here is. I don't know. I'm going to make that a seven or something like that. But it never actually crossed. But because it told us that the function was continuous, then we knew that our graph had to pass through. Does that make sense? Okay. So one thing I really wanted to emphasize here, y'all, with this problem is that when I'm doing a problem like this, like my first approach when I saw this problem was, look what they told me. They gave me this and they gave me that. Let me at least draw a picture. Because now I draw a picture and I understand that the function has to be continuous, then in order for me to connect those two dots, yeah, I got to cross it with the x axis, right? So it was more of a, can I figure this out by given, given the information that I have? Yes, sir. Question? Yeah, I was well, if it if it was not continuous, yeah, then you could sometimes be true and sometimes be false, right? Yeah. All right. So let's take a look, y'all. First 19 problems appear to be out of chapter two. 20 through 40 got to be from chapter three, right? So again, half and half, right? Are y'all good at finding the derivative of this one? Everybody okay? Anybody need help? Y'all tell me. What you think? We're good? Everybody's good? Okay. What about number 21? Or, or, let's, let's do 20. Let me ask you a question. Are y'all good on 21? What would you have to do on 21? Find the derivative and then do what? So I'll get in four. Okay. 22, for this part, wouldn't I find the derivative and then plug in what value? 2. And then, to do the y equals mx plus b, do we already have our value for y1 and y2? Or x1 and x1 and uh, y1? Yeah, we already got them, right? Okay, guys, so I'm going to just kind of, and look at number 23. Isn't 23 almost identical to 22? Okay. So look, I'm just going to kind of keep moving along here, and you tell me when you see a problem that you want me to do. You guys want 24? Okay, 24. So take a look here. When I'm doing 24, y'all, let me zoom in a little bit so I can see this a little bit better. When I'm doing 24, aren't we finding the derivative of a product using the first and the second number? So remember, y'all, when I'm finding the derivative of a product, it's always going to be the first function times the derivative of the second plus the second times the derivative of the first. Okay? And in this case, you're being evaluated at what value? At 8, right? Okay, so the first function, y'all, in this case, is my f of h, right? So we're going to say f of 8 times my second function is g, but it's the derivative of that. So g prime at 8 plus the second function, which is my g function, g of 8 times the derivative of my first one, f prime at 8. So far, are we okay? 
and how we got to where we are? Okay, now we're just going to do plug and chug. Okay, what's f of 8? 5. What's g prime at 8? Negative 4, good. g of 8 is? 2. Excellent. f prime at 8, y'all, is negative 1. So isn't this a negative 20 minus 2, a negative 22? Does that work? Yeah? Good. Excellent, y'all. Good job. Okay, there is a part B to that problem. So remember, when I have when I have a function that's a quotient, the rule is the bottom function times the derivative of the top minus the oops, I didn't write it that way. The bottom function times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom all over the bottom squared, right? Okay, so again, I'm going to do the same kind of approach here, y'all. Okay, the bottom function is our g. So we're going to say g of a times the top function, which is my f, f prime at a. Minus the top function, which is f of a, times the derivative of the bottom, which is g prime at a, all over the bottom function, what? Being what? Squared, right? Okay. Before I go on, am I okay on how I got to where I am? Jennifer, am I doing okay? Okay, just checking with you guys. All right, so look, do we know what g of 8 is equal to? Two, good. F prime at eight. Everybody agree? Negative one, good. Minus F of eight. Five, excellent, guys. G prime at eight. Negative four. All over G of eight being squared. Two squared, right? Okay, so look, negative two times one. Negative two. Everybody agree that's going to give me a positive 20 over 4, so that's 18 over 4, which is 9 halves. So I'd probably put 9 over 2. If you want to write 4.5, I don't see why you could. Yeah, very good. Okay, what do y'all think for number 25? Are you all good with finding first derivative, second derivative, third derivative, fourth derivative? Do we want to go through it? What do you think? We're good? You sure? Okay, I'm just checking, guys. Remember, don't don't feel don't feel shy, guys. If, if you got five people saying, or four, how many of us are here today? Five of us. If four people are saying I'm good and you're kind of not good, speak up, y'all. It's okay. You know, we put it this way. What time does our class officially end? Anybody know? 250, right? It's 125. So we got time. You know what I mean? Look, we're on question 25. We know we got about 15 more questions to do, but I'm just saying if you all need it, let me know, okay? What do you think, 26? Are you good? Do you want to go through it? Let's go through it. Okay, look what it says. Find the equation of the tangent line. Okay, first thing, when it tells me find the equation of the tangent line, everybody agree we're going to find y prime because that's going to give me the what? The, I know it gives me the derivative, but what else does it give me? Slope, right? Excellent. Good, y'all. Okay, so look, if my y is 6 sine of x, what's the derivative of sine of x? Uh, cosine of x, and then you would have to take the derivative of the value, but because we're differentiating with respect to x, it's just going to give me y. Okay? Now, Second thing, everybody agree we're now going to find y prime at, in this case, pi over 6? Yeah. Okay. Now, again, y'all, if, if your calculator is more advanced, plug it in. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to come back over here. Uh, let me see. Let me get out of this part here. 
I'm going to scroll up to the very top where I got my formula sheets and all that kind of stuff, y'all. And again, you know, I just put this in here, y'all, because I thought it would be helpful. Um, but look, we're looking at cosine at pi over six. Everybody agree four to three over two? Right, times six. But do you agree that cosine of pi over six is four to three over two? Again, y'all, so look, I'm, I'm going to put it like this. If, if I'm sitting where you're sitting, right, like, so whenever I'm going to take the test, and I'm guessing everybody here, you have a laptop, an iPad, a Chromebook, whatever at home, right? I would just download this, right? I'm going to save this in a little, you know what I'm saying? So I have something to reference to, right? And at the end, I'm going to have a, so I'm going to do it like this, open the system viewer. Yeah, so I'm going to have this readily available, you know what I mean? And do the same thing with the formula sheet too, right? Okay. Do, yeah, do, do whatever it is you need to do, right? But my point is, like, just make sure that you have this kind of stuff, you know, like, easily available. So I would do the same thing here. Formula sheet, right? And I download it. Oh, man. Here we go. And I'm going to open it with my viewer. Okay, so I got my formula sheet. I got my trig. You know what I'm saying? I just have all this stuff readily available, right? So just make sure you have it easily access, guys, so that you're not, you know, scrolling back and forth and all that kind of fun stuff. Okay. So we said that uh, this was equal to six times the square root of three over two. So won't this two and that six reduce? So that's going to give me a three square root of three. Isn't that giving me the slope of the tangent line? Okay. So look right here, y'all. We found the slope of the tangent line. Look at the first question or the first part. The equation of this tangent line has a slope of what? Three square root of three. Does that make sense on how we got to that first part? Because the first thing says, what's the equation of the tangent line? Well, hey, that's that's what it happens to be. Okay. Now let's do the second part of it. So remember the point that we have, the point that we were giving y'all was pi over six and three. Okay, so now this is my x1, that's my y1. So we're going to go y minus 3 equals 3 square root of 3 x minus pi over 6. Move over so I got a little bit of room here. Right, just a little bit neater. y minus 3 equals, let's see, everybody agree that's 3 square to 3 with an x minus, let's see, I'm just going to write it out like this, 3, oops, 3 square to 3 pi over 6, and I'll do some reducing right now in a second, but we got y minus 3 equals 3 square to 3 with an x. This 3 and that 6 will cancel to a 2, so a minus Square root of 3 and a pi all over 2. And then don't I need to move that 3 over there? So 3 square root of 3 with an x minus a 3 pi over 2 plus 3. I guess I'll think about that as 3 over 1. Okay. And guys, I'm going to go just a little bit further. I'm going to I'm going to write this as a single fraction. Do you agree with me that we could do this? make that a 2, and make that a 6 to get our common denominator, because 3 over 1 is the same thing as 6 over 2. So then what I would do, and I'm going to check to see how they're, how they're writing their answer in my open math, but this is probably how, it, how I would write it out, right? And again, that's just because, you know, I'm a math dude, right? My, my, my feeling is my uh, field is not like engineering or anything like that, so I'm running as this is what we call the exact answer, right? But I want to check to see how does my open math actually write this? So what question number was this? 26? Okay, so look, I'm going to do this real quick. and come back over here. This is number 26. Let me preview this guy. Okay, so they're using decimal approximation, okay? So you can do this as a decimal. So if you wanted to, instead of writing 4 to 3 over 3, you could grab your calculator, 3 
square root of three, close it off. There's the 5.1, you see what I'm saying? So that's how they're entering it in, right? I don't know if, um, I'm gonna try one more thing real quick here, y'all. Let me ask you a question. Is it, are you are you guys cool just doing everything in decimal approximation? The whole, like the whole, like written out like the way I have it here? Okay, so does it normally take them that way? Yeah. Okay, I, I just wasn't certain. So I'm just gonna, you know, I guess if I were to come back, I'd have to go through the student mode and all that kind of stuff. You know what, give me one second. I'm gonna try that real quick, y'all. I'm just curious to see, let me enter in again. I'm just curious if it's gonna let me enter it in that way. I, I believe you guys though. I don't know why you're messing with that. But let me see, let me go to the review. Launch it. 26. So we zoom. Let me go down here, number 26. Boom. So right here. Oh, it's a different it's a different function though. You said I mean I'd have to go through this one all over again. Because it gave me a different value. So I don't want to I don't want to screw with that. You know what I mean? It's giving me a, a whole new thing. Never know. Uh, so wouldn't it be four times the square root of three over two? So it would be two square root of three. Uh, I guess that. All right, here's submit. There you go. Yeah, but it looks like it looks like we can enter it in, right? So you can do it the long way if you want to. That's that's really what I'm doing there. Okay. All right. Just checking. Okay, get out of here. Okay. Okay. So let's keep moving along here. Uh, let's see. Question: Twenty-seven or twenty-eight? Anybody want either one of those two? Both of them? One of them? Neither of them? You guys tell me. Twenty-seven. Okay. So look, let me ask you a question. For twenty-seven, could we write it like this? Can we do that? Okay. And then if we were going to find y prime, wouldn't we say it would be one half? And then I leave everything in here alone. What's my power now? Negative one half. Excellent, guys. Very good. And then don't we got to take the derivative of what's inside? What rule am I using here? Chain rule. Good. Guys, I, I, I can't emphasize it enough. The chain rule is going to be so important, not only in this class. If you, I'm guessing that you guys are going to take calculus 2. You're going to use chain rule there again. I'm going to take, you're going to assume you're going to take calculus three. You're going to use chain rule there. You know what I mean? Chain rule is like, it's going to be attached at your hip. You're going to use it every single time. Okay. So look, what's the derivative of five X squared? 10 X. Uh, the derivative of three X plus three. Okay. So right here. Um, and I don't know, you know, how this, how, like a picky they are. It doesn't tell me anything about don't use negative exponents. It doesn't tell me anything like that. So theoretically, I should be able just to enter that in as it is. If I wanted to clean it up a little bit, I would probably write it as 10x plus 3 over. Now look, the 2 is on the bottom, right? So I'm going to leave the 2 on the bottom. Since that power is a negative 1 half, doesn't that really mean that I have the square root of 5x squared? plus 3x plus 8, and that square root is going to be downstairs because my exponent was negative. So number one, it's a square root because it's a power 1 half, but the square root term happens to be downstairs because it was a negative 1 half. Jennifer, am I doing okay? Yeah? Okay. Sometimes, guys, I go, I go a little, like, fast in my head, like I'm thinking of, you know what I'm saying? So I, do, I want to make sure I'm okay. Matthias, am I doing okay? Are we good with these? Okay. So what now? Okay. 
There you go. Okay, so what are we going to do now to evaluate it at five? Plug in chug at five, right? So I'll, I can leave that part to you guys. I know you know how to evaluate at five, but that's what we can do. Okay, let me ask you a question. For 28, for at least the first part, would we use the same approach on 28 as we did on 27? Would we still do it the same way as in, like if I was going to find y prime, wouldn't I say it's going to be 2x squared plus 5x plus 7? One less than that would just be a 1. And then don't I still got to take the derivative of what's indoors? Wouldn't that just be a 2x plus 5? Right? And, yeah, if it's not telling me to do any of that kind of distributing, guys, you don't need to worry about it. I, I don't think my open math is going to be that picky. And I'm not going to be that picky about it either. I'm sorry? Just the first step, yeah. So there's my y prime, right? Question, how would we do the second piece here? What would be the first step in doing the second part? Plug in the 4, right? So we'd find y prime at 4. So that would be 2, 4 squared plus 5 times 4, uh, plus 7, 2 times 4, plus 5. So this would be, that's 16, 20, and 7. That's 8 and 5, which is 13. Okay, I'm going to grab my calculator real quick so we can do some adding here. So 16 plus 20 plus 7. Looks like to be 43. So let's see, we got that times 2 and also times 13. So I'm coming up with 1118 for my slope. Okay. So 1118 would be my slope here, y'all. And then, do y'all agree that my next step would be y minus what? 18, or 1849 equals an 1118x minus 4. We're going to go 1 and 2. So that's still an 1118x minus whatever 1118 times 4 is. I don't know, a big number. 4472. And then the last step, how do I get rid of my 1849? Add it to both sides. So y equals an 1118x. And then um, negative of my answer plus, what were we adding to both sides? Uh, 1849, and I'm coming up with a minus 2623 to go right here. Right. And so right here, y'all, and so um, I know Matthias had asked me questions like this before. So in this part, y'all, for part B, like if I think about that part B, what is it asking me to put right here? I want you to do a little stare and compare. Look at what I have right here. What do you think it's asked me to put in this spot? The 1118, right? Because that's the number in front of the what? The X, right? And then what is it asking me to put over here? Isn't it just the minus 2623? Does that make sense? Oh, does my do okay? Yeah, okay. So in these problems, y'all, again, the way the way it's just the way the problem is written or the way they're asking you to submit your answer. I know we came up with an equation. All they want me to do is put the M in the first spot and the B in the second, right? That's all it's really asking me to do.
All right. So let me do this again, y'all. Uh, 29, 30, any, any questions out of 29 or 30? Y'all tell me. I don't have to help you guys. What you think, what you think, what you think. Thirty. Okay, so let's take a look at thirty. Thirty says f of five is equal to four. F prime at five is one fourth. Okay, so I got a couple of pieces of information here. All right, let's see. We're looking for let f inverse of x be the inverse function. We're looking for the derivative of the inverse at four. Okay, so y'all, one thing I want to emphasize here. See how they told me that f of five was equal to four. Do y'all agree with me that that means that f inverse of 4 is equal to 5? Does that make sense? So remember what this means. This is telling me that when the x value is 5, the y value is going to be 4, right? So what does the inverse function tell me? The inverse function tells me if I knew that the y value happened to be 4, what x value sent me there, oh, that x value would happen to be 5. Does that make sense? Okay. So what I'm going to do for this problem, y'all, I'm going to come back over here and I'm going to look at my formula sheet, okay? So I'm going to scroll down. And again, y'all, like I, I put in, basically I try to put in every blue box that we had in the formula sheet. And the only reason I did that was uh, if it's there, fine, maybe you need it, maybe you don't. But if it's not there, then that's not great. So that's why I put it in there, okay? So let me scroll. Here we go. Take a look. Since we're talking about inverse functions, I want to look at my inverse function theorem. Okay. Okay, so look what it says. If I'm taking the derivative of f inverse of x, the derivative of f inverse of x is 1 over the derivative of f inverse of, of f inverse of x, okay? So look, I'm gonna I'm gonna basically copy this part down right here. Okay. So let me come back to my problem. Let me write this over here on the side. So when I have f inverse of x, when I have f inverse of x, and we're taking the derivative of that, that's gonna be equal to 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. 1 over f prime of f inverse of x. Okay. So I want us to take a look at the problem that we have. We're trying to find f inverse of 4, and we are taking the derivative of that. So that's going to be equal to 1 over f prime of f inverse of 4. Didn't we write this down earlier, y'all? Didn't we say f inverse of 4 was equal to what number? That was equal to 5. Okay. And then I'm going to come back over here. And do we know what f prime of 5 is? f prime of 5 is 1 fourth. So isn't 1 divided by 1 fourth really just the same thing as 4? So right here for my first part, y'all, I'm going to plug in a 4. <coughs> Before I go on, does it make sense on how we did the, at least how we got the first part done by using that, that, that formula that I had in my formula sheet for the inverse functions? Excuse me, all I did, y'all, again, just to, just to recap, all I did is I looked at this part right here. I looked at this piece, and all I did is I said, look, I'm going to take that, and I'm going to write it right here. Okay. And then instead of at X, the question is asking me, hey, can we do this at 4? So all I'm doing is I'm just replacing it at 4. But we knew that F inverse at 4 was equal to 5, right? Okay, 
So we got a four for the first part. Now the second part says, can we write the equation of the tangent line to the inverse at x equals four? Okay, so <clears throat> since we're finding the tangent line, y'all, at the inverse, it's telling me, look, x is four, wouldn't that mean that y is five? Because if we know f inverse of four is five, that's telling me that when the x value is four, the y value is five. All we're gonna do now, y'all, y minus y1 equals m x minus x1. So y minus five equals, look what we got for our m, four, x minus four, so y minus 5 equals a 4x and a minus 16. And then I'm just going to add 5 to both sides. And isn't that a 4x and what, a minus 11? And we got that 4x minus 11. Are we okay? We're good so far? Anybody? I want to make sure I'm not going too fast, you guys. We all good here? This was number, which one was this that we just did? Uh, 30? Yeah. So look, we'll come back over here. Let's take a look at number 30. Preview it. Again, number 30. Preview, preview. And I guess it still has me from the student perspective. Let me try this one more time. Oh, man. Here we go. Boom. Do the review. Okay, here we go. Come back over here. End of the Ah, it changed my numbers, so I want to go through it, but it changed my numbers. Okay, there we go. <coughs> Excuse me. All right. Anybody need help with either 31 or 32? It's just using my formula sheet, right? Isn't, isn't this what I would do, y'all, for, for like 31 and 32? Here's my, my uh, derivatives of my inverse trig function. So I would just kind of do a little stare and compare. Let's do one of them. Let's do, I don't know, let's do 32. Just to make sure that we're good. We're finding the derivative of the arctangent of 3x. So remember, y'all, if it helps or, or if you forget, think about it like this. It's y equals the tangent inverse, in this case, of 3x. Because arctangent... It's just another way of saying tangent inverse, right? Just another way of saying tangent inverse. So when I use my formula sheet here, y'all, okay, tangent inverse, here we go. Look what we're gonna do. We're gonna take the derivative of the angle, that's gonna go to the top, and it's gonna be one plus the angle squared on the bottom. So the derivative of the angle, what's the derivative of three x? Three over one plus the angle being squared wouldn't that be 3 over 1 plus 9x squared? And you're done, right? That's all you got to do. And so again, it's, it's just using that formula sheet, right? It's just using that formula sheet. Okay. Let's see. Okay, what about what about implicit differentiation, you guys? What do you think? You guys want me to do number 33? Y'all want it? You don't want it? You tell me, y'all. We got plenty of time. We got an hour, guys. So I'm here to answer any questions y'all have. So if you want me to do 33, you know I'm happy to do it. Let's do it. Okay, we're going to go piece at a time. Okay, we're going to go real slow here, y'all. What's the derivative of negative 30x to the 10th? Negative 
300 x to what power? There you go. Okay, remember y'all, I got to think of this as the first function, and I got to think of this one as the second function. So when I do the derivative of my product, it's the first function, 7x to the 30th. What's the derivative of y? Uh, dy, dx. dy dx. You can call it dy dx. You can call it y prime. Doesn't really make any difference. Plus, the second function times the derivative of the first. What would the derivative of 7x to the 30th be? 210 x to the 29th. Good. Plus, now we got to find the derivative of y to the 8th. Anybody know the derivative of y to the 8th? Okay. Very good. And then finally, what's the derivative of a negative 22? Okay. It's the chain rule, but think about it this way. I want you. I want you to notice something here. When we found the derivative of this problem here, we took the derivative of y. What did we call it? Same thing as dy dx. You were you were already doing the dy dx to begin with. We've been doing it since since day one. Good, good, good. Okay, so let's come back here. Here we go. Okay, so now we got this part. Remember what we're going to do, y'all? We're going to part put the dy dx's together. So I'm going to leave this guy as it is, 7x to the 30th with a dy over dx. And I'm going to put that plus 8y to the 7th with a dy dx right next door to him. And then don't we need to move this piece here and that piece there to the right side? So a positive 300x to the 9th. And then a negative, everybody agree, 210x to the 29th with a y? Okay. All right. What can we factor out of here? Okay. So we have a dy over dx. We've got a 7x to the 30th plus an 8y to the 7th equals 300 x to the 9th minus a 210 x to the 29 <coughs> excuse me 29 and a y and finally what is our last step y'all uh, divide, divide everything out right so wouldn't we get dy dx equals 300 x to the 9 minus 210 x to the 29th and a y all over our 7x to the 30th and a plus 8y to the second. And there's our dy dx, right? And we really, again, really what we're doing here, y'all, we're just doing that implicit differentiation, right? So, very good. Guys, let me ask you a question. As we're going through these problems, this was number of what, 30 something? 30, this was number 33. As we're going through these problems, this was number 33. How are you feeling about the test? Like, are you feeling like, okay, this is manageable? Or are you feeling like, oh my God. You know what I mean? How do you feel? On a level of 1 to 10, 10 being like, man, I'm going to get an A. And 1 being like, uh, I don't know if I'm going to come back up to soon, but how do you guys how do you guys feel do you feel do you feel closer to the 10 range or do you feel closer to the one range closer to the 10 range like is has there been any questions that we've gone through so far that you were just like i don't ever remember doing this or like we never did this the beginning some of the limit stuff just like just just remembering okay so again remember what that means though it just means that you got to take some time to review, right? You got to take some time. Use the formula sheet, y'all. The formula sheet's going to be really helpful. 
as you can see, I've, I've used it a couple of times just to figure out certain parts. But yeah, these are certain things that I got to know, right? Okie dokie. Let's see. So that was number 33. How do you guys feel about 34 or 35? Are they the same type of problems? You want me to do something different? You want me to figure it out? What do you think? Y'all want 34? You want 35? You want both of them? You want neither of them? You tell me. Both. Let's do them both. Okay. So let's take a look at the first one here. 34. So I'm just going to write it over on the side, y'all, where I have a little bit more room. X squared over 25. Y squared over 16 is 1. Okay. So X squared over 25. Y squared over 16 is equal to 1. And it told me something else, too. Uh, y of 1 is 3.92. So it says y of 1 is 3.92. And it wants us to find y prime at 1. Okay, so let's take the derivative. Remember, y'all, you can think about this as a, if it helps, do it like this. Put your x squared in front. If it helps, do it like that. Just so that you understand that the 1 over 25 and the 1 over 16, they're just constant. It's no different if you had a 7, okay? So what would the derivative of 1 over 25 x squared be? 2 over 25 with an x. Okay. What's the derivative of 16 y squared? 2 over 16 with a what? Y, I'm sorry, with a y and then a y prime? Okay, and then equals what over here? Zero. Okay, so yes, I agree, Linda, we're going to reduce that to make it do a 1 over 8. 1 over 8. Okay. Y'all agree we got to move this side over to that side? Okay, so we have 1 over 8 with a y and a y prime is equal to, what, a negative 2x over 25? And then, can we multiply everything by 8? Just to get rid of these 8s here. So I'm going to be left with a y and a y prime equals a negative 16x over 25? I'm sorry? The chain rule, right? Remember, when I'm taking the derivative of y squared, isn't it, I bring the 2 down, and then it's 2y, and then I still got to do the y prime, or like the dy dx, because I'm using that chain rule. Right? Just So, like, let me scroll back over here, because we did it this way, too. Remember when, let's see, what was it? In this problem here, when we took the derivative of y to the 8th, we said it was 8y to the 7th, but then we had the dy dx. I'm doing the same thing in this one here. The derivative of y squared is a 2y, but then I still got the derivative of y. Let's see. That's right. Because I'm taking the derivative with respect to x, right? So i got to figure out that part there. Guys, one last step. Y'all agree that we can multiply both sides by 1 over y to get rid of these guys? And we now have y prime equals a negative 16x over 25y. Does that seem good? Uh, I'm sorry? Nothing. Uh, I was just wondering if you well, remember, when you're taking the square root, how many square roots would we end up with? One positive, one negative, right? This is why we're doing implicit differentiation, right? So, otherwise, now you got a whole mess of a problem that you got to try to deal with, right? And that's the whole point of implicit differentiation. How do you find the derivative? Of an, e, of, a, of, an e, of a graph or an equation where you cannot explicitly solve it for a while. That's the easy implicit differentiation. Okay, look, y'all, now we want to evaluate it at, because we're looking for y prime at 1. 
So y prime at 1, remember what this means. This means that when x is 1, y is what? 3.92. So when I'm finding y prime at 1, isn't this what I'm really doing? Okay, so look, uh, I already know I'm upstairs, that's just a negative 15. But downstairs, 25 times 3.92, I don't know, it's close to 100. 98. And I know we can reduce that. I don't know what it reduces to, but I'll do it like this. 16 over 98. And math, and fraction. What does it reduce to? 8 over 49. Okay. So negative 8 over 49. Okay. So all we're going to do is I'm going to scroll back over here. And 8 over 49. Was, was it positive or negative? Negative. negative. Okay. Oops, don't forget the negative. There we go. Right. Because you're already taking the derivative of respect to x, right? And the derivative of x is? So we need some like because like all you're doing is multiplying by one. Right? Okay, so look, let's do 35. We'll do it the same way. So it's x plus y to the fourth times x squared and y to the fifth. Okay, so let's see. x plus y to the fourth. We'll write it over here. Equal, so is it x squared y to the fifth? Yeah. X squared, y to the fifth, and the values were, what, one and two. Okay, so, and the point that was given to us was the point one, two. Okay, we're going to go through again, y'all, pieces, right? We're using both the chain rule and implicit differentiation. So we're taking the derivative of this guy right here. What would be the first thing I'm going to write down? Four. Four. Okay, and then we have to take the derivative of what's inside. Yeah, so the derivative of x is 1, the derivative of y, again, dy dx. If y'all like using y prime, use y prime, y'all. Okay. Again, is there a right way or wrong way? It's your way, right? Is it better? It's up to you, right? But uh, again, same thing, right? You're going to go about it the way you're doing it. Look, y'all, first function, second function. Remember, when I'm taking the derivative of the product, it's always the first function. So the first function is x squared times the derivative of y to the fifth. Everybody agree that would be a 5y to the fourth, one extra part, dy dx. Linda, are we good with the dy dx while we're putting that dy dx in? I want to make sure I'm doing okay. Like, why do we need the dy dx? Okay, and then the second function, which is y to the fifth, times the derivative of the first. What's the derivative of x squared? 2x, right? Good. Right, the derivative of x squared is just 2x, right? Bring the exponent down, and then one left. Good, very good. Okay, so we're going to go through in pieces here. First step, y'all, I'm going to take this guy, and we're going to distribute it to both of those parts. So we have a 4x plus y to the third plus a 4x plus y to the third and a dy dx equals an x squared. Uh, let me put the 5 in front. Oops. Let me put the 5 in front, x squared, y to the fourth and then a dy dx plus a 2x and a y to the fifth. All right. Everybody agree we want to get the dy dx's together and leave the other guys on the other side? So look, this guy is going to stay where it is. 4x plus y to the third and dy dx. 
since this one has a dy dx, I want to bring it to the other side of the equation. Y'all agree it's going to become a negative 5x squared, y to the fourth, and a dy dx. Okay. I'm going to leave this guy alone where he is, 2x, y to the fifth, but we're going to move this one also over to the right side. So wouldn't that become a minus 4x plus y? To the third? So far we're good? Okay. All right. Next step. What can we factor out over here, y'all? What do they both have? There you go. Okay, and then finally, what did we say our last step to do was? Divide it, right? Good. Excellent. Very good, y'all. dy dx, 2xy to the fifth, minus 4x plus y to the third, okay, over 4x plus y to the third, minus 5x squared, y to the fourth, right? Okay, so now that we did all of that funky business, then remember the next step was, it gave me the point, when we started off, y'all, it gave me the point one, two, okay? So look, this is all we're gonna do now. I'm gonna come back over here, and I'm gonna say, we're gonna find dy dx, evaluated at the point one, two. Okay, so now I'm going to start, I'm going to go real slow here. Let me see, two times one times two to the fifth. 2 times 2 to the 5th, it's really 2 to the 6th, but 64, minus 4 times, 1 plus 2 is 3, yeah, that I know, and 3 to the 3rd is 27, okay. and this is also a 4 with a 27, and let's see, 2 to the 4th is 16, so 5 times 16, 8. So now I've got to figure out what's 4 times 27? 108. So that's a, 10, a 108. So now upstairs I have a 64 minus 108, that's a negative 44. On the bottom, we already said this was 108 minus 80, that should give us a 28. And I bet you we can divide them both by four, and that's gonna give me a negative 11 over seven. Okay, so first thing I'm gonna do y'all, I'm gonna come back to, again, you know, I needed all my, all my paper to write the whole thing out. So then I'm going to scroll back over here. Okay, so dy dx, okay, we had already done dy dx and we got this piece right here. And that's what we would have entered into the first little box, right? dy dx would have been that, that gradual expression. Okay, so now that we've done this next step and we came up with are negative 11 over 7. Y'all agree that that really gave me the slope of the tangent line, right? And remember the point that we used was the point 1 and 2? So yeah, aren't we just going to go y minus y1 equals m x minus x1? 
So y minus 2 is a negative 11 7 x minus 1. So y minus 2 is a negative 11 7 x plus 11 over 7. And then I'm going to go ahead and add 2 to both sides. Y'all, I'm, just to, just to, I'm going to think about that as a 2 over 1. And John says, look, we can change this 2 over 1 to a 14 over 2. So we can get, oh, I'm sorry, over 7. My bad, my bad. Over 7 so that we can get our common denominator. And let's see, 25. So we're coming up with a y equals negative 11 over 7x plus 25 over 7. And then all I would do is come back over here. Again, notice how the notice how it's written, y'all. Wouldn't I just put a negative 11 over 7 here and a 25 over 7 right there? Just because of the way they have the equation written. But I'm just letting you all know that's that part. I'll leave this up here. So in case anybody needs to copy any of this part here down. Okay. And I'm going to check to see those few folks who are with us online, see how they're doing. Let's see. No, are we doing okay, No. I just want to make sure you're good. Okay. Well, okay, just checking with you, bud. If you got any questions, throw them out there too, Noel, okay? Uh, much better? Is that question better now that we went through it? Yeah? Okay, good, good, good. Again, y'all, we just want to make sure you guys feel okay about most of these problems, you know, see how they're how they're coming through. And yeah, like this problem here, it's it's just messy, right? Because you know, you got all these parts to it. But again, if I go slow and I, I'm able usually to figure it out. Uh question, let's see. What about anybody got any questions on 36 or 37? Here's 36, and here's 37. Anybody need any help with 36 or 37? I'm sorry? 37? Oh. Well, 36 and 30, 36 and 37, y'all, are using logarithmic differentiation, right? So I'm not really using the implicit differentiation here, but I'm using the logarithmic stuff. But I just want to make sure you guys are okay with it. 37. Let's do 37 for you. Okay. So look, again, I'm going to do it on the side, y'all, because just I kind of ran out of room here a little bit. So e to the x to the third over 1 minus the square root of x minus 3. We're just finding the derivative. So y equals e to the x to the third over the square root of 1 minus, who is x to the third? Okay. Okay. So, question, you guys. You all agree with me? Top function? Bottom function? Okay. When I'm picking the derivative, it's always the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom square. Guys, again, you know, as I'm going through this thing here, I hope there's certain, like, things that you're noticing like when i see a fraction that's just going to be my approach i'm just going to write that down because it helps me remember number one it helps me remember the quotient rule like how to take the derivative of fraction and then i can just do a little stare and compare so look what's the bottom function here well the bottom function would be one minus x to the third now when we take the derivative of the top the derivative of e to the x to the third y'all is just e x to the third and then using the chain rule, I got to take the derivative of that exponent. What's the derivative of x to the third? 3x squared. Okay. 
minus the top function, which is ex to the third. Now, we do got to take the derivative of this guy right here. Okay, so look. Think about it this way. Think about that 1 minus x to the third, the square root. Think about it as 1 minus x to the third to the 1 half. If we're taking the derivative of this, when we take the derivative, wouldn't it be 1 half, 1 minus x to the third to what power? Negative, Negative 1 half. And then don't we got to take the derivative of what's inside? Very good. Everybody agree? Are we good on that part? Just taking the derivative of that part? Okay, so look, y'all. We're going to write 1 half, 1 minus x to the third, negative 1 half, and a negative 3x squared. Okay. Over the bottom function squared. What happens when we square the square root? Okay, now I know this is ugly because it is. It's okay for you to leave it that way. Okay, so I know earlier John mentioned like some of the problems, like you know, we're trying to simplify all this kind of stuff. This problem here, y'all, you can leave it that way. And it's pretty messy, right? Just leave it like that, okay? So notice, yeah, it, I mean, it's simplified. There's going to be a lot of algebra here. The question was just telling me to take the derivative. We took the derivative. There it is. Okay. But excellent question. I think it's a good question. You know, we, we did some problems before we had to take the derivative of exponentials, but not a whole lot. So I like this one because we did have that ex to the third. So we have to kind of do a little bit of work here, right? You have to do any logarithmic differentiation and all that for this problem. This is just a straight uh, quotient problem for just remembering the chain rule when we're taking the derivative of an exponent. And y'all, I'm going to pull something up real quick because I want to say it's in here. Here we go. Let me see if I can find it. Here we go. So look, y'all, when, when we have uh, an e to the x or an e to the gx, it's probably better this way. When you have e to the function and you're taking the derivative, it's the same thing and then take the derivative of the exponent. Okay? So when I'm taking the derivative of e to some function, it's e to that same function and then the derivative of whatever that exponent happens to be. So again, y'all, uh, you know, if you need to, that's why I made the formula sheet so that if you need to reference something, you know, hopefully you're not scrolling through a whole bunch of stuff on there, right? It should be, hopefully, I should be able to find it, okay? Good. We'll get there in a minute. Jennifer? Yeah, yeah, of course, of course, of course. So again, just to just to kind of recap what I did here, Jennifer, uh, let me do this. Remember we said, look, it's the bottom function times the derivative of the top. So look, here's the bottom function. The derivative of ex to the third was the same thing, ex to the third, but then take the derivative of that, which was 3x squared, minus the top function. So minus, there's the top function right there, the derivative of the bottom. And we did the derivative of that right over here right he said look think of think of the square root of one minus x to the third as one minus x to the third to the power one half what happens oh that exponent comes downstairs we leave this inside alone and we subtract one from that so that's how we got the negative one half and then take the derivative inside negative three x squared over the bottom function being squared well when we square the square root it just goes away and then we're left with right that part there yeah, you're welcome, you're welcome. Okay, so look, y'all, we got three more problems left. 38, 39, and 40. Tell me which ones. The last one? Okay, let's do the last one. Okay, so let's put it like this. Remember what we're trying to do. We're trying to take the derivative of the natural log of this thing here. 
So you, the easy way to think about this, if I'm going to take the derivative of this, look, let me come back to my formula sheet here. Uh, where is this? Here we go. Here we go. Look, if I'm taking the derivative of the natural log of some function, it's 1 over that function times the derivative of what's inside, right? So notice, the g of x, you agree with me, the g of x is inside my natural log. So it's 1 over that and then the derivative of the inside. So look, I'm going to come back over here. We're going to say the derivative of this is going to be 1 over 4x minus 6 over 2x squared plus 8x plus 36. Okay. times the derivative of what we have inside. Okay. Can I think of this as the top function and that of the bottom function? So when I take the derivative, it's the bottom times the derivative of the top minus the top times the derivative of the bottom over the bottom function squared, right? Okay. So all of that is going to get multiplied by this deal right here. Okay. The bottom function. We're going to go slow. 2x squared plus 8x plus 36. Okay. Times the derivative of the top. What's the derivative of 4x minus 6? Okay. Minus the top function. Uh, 4x minus 6 times the derivative of the bottom. What's the derivative of 2x squared? What's the derivative of 8x? 8. And the derivative of 36? All over the bottom function being squared. That would be 2x squared plus 8x plus 36 squared. Okay. Now, Guys, I'm just going to do a couple of small things here. This guy right here, if it's 1 over that, wouldn't that really mean that it's 2x squared plus 8x plus 36 on the top and 4x minus 6 on the bottom? Because if it's 1 over something, it's like the reciprocal, right? So I'm really just taking the reciprocal there. Okay. And then... And I'm just going to put this in brackets, right? Just so I keep things separated, right? So if you've got to keep them separated. Okay. Now we have this one. Probably before you guys are born. <laughs> All right. Okay, upstairs up here, y'all. If I multiply the 4, isn't that an 8x squared? And 4 times 8 is 32. And 4 times 36. One forty-four. Okay. Now, look, I'm going to keep going here. Let's see. I'm going to put this in parentheses because I'm going to just have to do some subtracting in a minute because the minus is out there. 16. Good. 4x times 8 is a 32. Okay. Uh, we said a minus or plus 32x. Okay. Negative 6 times 4 is a negative 24x. This is a minus 48. Okay. Okay. Guys, as I keep going here, do you all notice that wouldn't this 2x plus or 2x squared plus 8x plus 36, if there's two of them on the bottom and there's one of them on the top, wouldn't this guy here? cancel with one of those, right? So that, that, that's something like, okay, well, look, we can at least fix that. So look, now I have a 1 over a 4x minus 6. Okay, I'm going to leave this 8x squared alone. I'm going to leave that 32x and the 144 alone. And I'm going to go ahead and distribute my minus sign. But can we combine these guys to begin with? What's 32 minus 24? Uh, a little bit more, 8. So this piece right here, y'all, really became a positive 8x. Okay. Right, when we, distribute, when we distribute our negative sign, that's going to be a negative 16x squared 
and a minus 8x and a positive 48. And I still got that 2x squared on the bottom. Right. Uh, let's see. Can we combine some of those like terms up there? Okay. All right. 8 minus 16? Negative 8x squared. Uh, 32 minus 8? 24 with an x. Uh, 144 and 48, 192, yeah, 192, good, you guys are doing great, all over this business right here, okay. um, yeah, I'm not going to distribute anything, the only thing I thought was maybe we could Factor something up there. So there's a possibility that we can. Yeah, I mean we can we can probably you might even build a factor of eight. You know what I mean? Like does eight go into one ninety two? Because I know eight goes into twenty four, and then eight goes into eight. Obviously, does eight go into one ninety two? Right about eight, does it? Yeah, it does, right? So like again, I'm not I'm not necessarily saying that I got to keep going, y'all. So look, one thing I this is this is one thing I'm gonna do. I'm gonna come back over here. Okay. So that was that was the question I was gonna ask was when I get to question number 40, right, and I preview it, uh, and I do this. So they came up with that, um, and I know they had different numbers, but. Um, I'm sorry? Your detailed solution? Okay, so they actually broke theirs up a whole lot. They did theirs a little bit of a different approach. They used like properties and logs. But, you know, I guess my question, and I'll, and I'll you know, I'm kind of curious if, like, that's how, it. That's how you solve it, properties and logs too? Yeah. Um, you know, we could probably leave it like this and probably be okay. Um, I don't necessarily know, you know, do we need to separate it more? I mean, we just, we just did ours this way, you know what I mean? But algebraically, we're ending up with the same thing. So it doesn't look like you've got to do a whole lot of simplifying on this. Like, I mean, we might have been able to enter in our answer, you know what I mean? Yeah, well, you got to know both, right? But we might have been able to enter our answer even just like this at one step. You know what I mean? So it was just take the derivative. You know what I mean? So again, all I'm doing here, y'all, I'm just simplifying, making it, trying to make it a little bit smaller. But I don't even think you need to do that much. You know what I mean? So, uh, but question, do you, again, how do you guys feel about these problems are you feeling any better in terms of like how you can you know how we can do them again it, it doesn't look like y'all in terms of the answers you know it, it seems like for a lot of the problems you don't have to do a lot of simplifying you know what i mean like the algebra part of it you can leave it as it is so like the problem that steve asked me earlier which was number 37 we can we can leave the answer like that and so like even if i come back over here let me come back over here and let me look at 37. And again, it might be a slightly different problem. So there's a slightly different, but if I look at their answer, do you see how it's all written out kind of like this? Do you see how it's all written out? And then when we did R37, let me come back over here. So I know we did R37. Here we go. When we did R37 and we got, this is how I wrote my 37. So look, it was like, Square root of 1 minus x to the third, e to the x to the third, 3x squared, minus e to the x to the third, 1 half, all this stuff, power negative 1 half, right? When I look at their 37, do you see how it's written very similarly, right? So, so again, you're not really having to simplify too, too much in these problems. Does that make sense? So as long as you, get your, as long as you can compute your derivative lines, you should be okay, okay? Uh, question, when does the test open? 
today at what time? 2.50, right? As soon as class is over. The test will be open today. Uh, is there a time limit on the test? No time limit on the test, right? Can you do part of it at one time, part of it another? Okay, when does the test do? A week from today, right? So next Wednesday at what time? Anybody know? At the time class starts, right? At 12.30. So guys, it's due at class time, okay? So it's not due at the end of the day. It's due actually at class time next Wednesday. You know what I mean? So you basically got a week to get it done. Are we going to see each other on Monday? No class Monday, right? That's me giving you the day to take the test. You understand my point? So no class Monday, guys. That's me giving you the day to take the exam. Does that make sense? So this is how I look. This is basically this is how I look at it, right? This is how I look at it. Our class is not an in, is not an online class, right? It's an in-person class. So the way I look at it is, if your schedule is so busy that you don't have time outside of class to take the test, I'm giving you Monday to take the test, right? But I, I open up the test early so that if you want to, you don't have to wait until Monday. But nobody can ever say, well, I didn't, he didn't give me time to do it. You understand my point? Not only is a test, and, and it's not like, I'm not giving you to because I expect you to work on the test on Sunday. I don't expect you to do it Sunday. I don't expect you to do it Saturday, right? But the test is open so that if you wanted to do it on the weekend, right, you could if you wanted to, but nobody's obligated to. But I'm giving you that day Monday. That's, that's I mean, really, I could have said, look, everybody has to come in. We're going to meet in the computer lab. Y'all got to do it Monday. You have some 1230 classes over. I don't want to do it like that, right? Take the test whenever you want to. But I'm giving you the day to take the test. Does that make sense? Plus more time in case you need it. And then look, right here, when I go to the test, um, when I do this business right here, and I'll actually do it from the student perspective, because again, it's it's not really any different. But when you click on the weekly activities folder right here, and you click on test one, right? So here are the instructions, right? So the instructions, formula sheet, here's the review. Test one has 20 questions chosen directly from the review. It's due by 12.30 March 9th. Uh, let's see, blah, blah, blah. I guess I didn't put that the test one was going to open up at um, 2.50 today, but I'll, I'll fix that here so that you guys know that it's open. You get two shots at the test, right? If you're happy with the grade, you don't got to try it again. But if you do, I always take the better of the two. Right? So, um, so actually, let me, let me do this real quick. And I'm going to just put in here that the test is opening up today at, uh, what time did we say? At 2.50, right? So it doesn't be open in about 15 minutes. Give me one quick second here. Boom, there we go. That's one opens today at 2.50. Okay, have a nice weekend, you guys.